a 25 million annual recurring within 18 months. Let's invest zero of our own dollars. Let's raise zero dollars. We can take a business doing a million in revenue and within a couple months, get them on the trajectory to hit 5 million. The advantage that we have is this insane ability to acquire customers for mm. a service business. It took us three and a half months to crack a $3 million run rate. Announcing and launching, what is it, 10 to 12 agencies? Uh, 12. During 12 months? 12 during yeah. 12 months. Before that, you were running like more traditional agencies, right? Yeah, I, I've, I've built a couple of traditional agencies. Um, I've sold one and then another I built into the eight figures uh, and grew to hate it <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I spent uh, probably a good seven years in my background. So I think it's really interesting here is that you've kind of had a, I guess, a big mindset shift in going from the traditional agency model. This is, uh, you can correct my assumption here, but um, towards what you're doing today, which is productized services as an agency, but also in collaborations with creators. And as of now, mainly B2B focused. Can you talk me about how that mindset shifted for you and how that came about? When you think about a traditional agency, every agency in the world, for the most part, struggles with how do I get customers, right? Typically, one of the biggest constraints in their business is new business. Um, you know, traditional agencies typically are going to have really long sales cycles and you have to go through SOWs. And if you're, if you're working in the enterprise or with larger companies like we were, you're dealing with procurement officers and, you know, master service agreements and SOWs and it really just becomes this nightmare of uh, bureaucracy. And then even when you sell into a, a client, you're dealing with all these political issues. Um, so for example, with Everest, we get to the point to where we would, you know, do like a, a year long, five, $6 million contract with a company and then embed 30, 40, 50 engineers and designers and product managers into their organization. So it was kind of uh, consulting more so than just like creative agency services. And it really became a business that I just hated. Mm. And so when I would sit and think about it, like, man, like, I wish this business was different. I'd always take the approach of like, what's the antithetical to how we're operating today? Well, what if we didn't have to have these bespoke offerings or hold clients hands? What if we didn't do contracts? What if we, you know, didn't have these super long sales cycles? And as you look through all of that, you really get to just productizing the service, right? Um, so really, I think the, the approach that we took for our agencies was that. It's just like, what's the exact opposite of how a traditional agency works? Yeah. Um, but the one, the one misunderstanding here is I never had the intention of saying, okay, I don't like traditional agencies anymore. I'm just going to productize them. Um, what I did want to do is I wanted to make the shift from like, okay, getting customers is hard to getting customers is easy. And that really for us was the shift um, by taking like a traditional business and kind of um, customer acquisition strategy to one that is creator, right? Um, it just so happens that when we made that shift and we were talking about, okay, we believe that building creator-led businesses, especially in the B2B space, is the future. What's the way for us to do it? What's the business we want to build? We didn't have a really clear answer. Um, you know, then there was the discussion between Sahil and I of like, well, do we want to invest our own money? How much do we want to invest? Do we want to raise funding? And for some reason, my dumb ass was like, no, let's not do any of that. Let's invest zero of our own dollars. Let's raise zero dollars. And what we'll do instead is we'll actually take that creator led approach, but put it behind productized agencies and just scale the revenue quickly. So we've really just viewed the productized agencies as a launch pad, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at them, some of our businesses are, are growing quite quickly and will be pretty big agencies on their own right. Um, but we wanted that to be the launch pad that serves as kind of like the cash flow engine and the creative services engine for everything else we do in the future, um, which is why we took that approach. And then along that route, again, kind of going on the thread of I'm a dumbass, I suggested that we do 12 of them. 
I said, you know what would be crazy is if we just did 12. Let's do one a month, basically. We'll launch 12 agencies in 12 months um, to really like make up ground quickly, right? Uh, and build a really healthy engine and a really big business really fast. Um, and that's what we've been doing and it's, it's working well. Uh, but all my friends are like, dude, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, being on the inside of it, I don't, I don't feel that way, but, uh, I get that to outsiders. It's like, we're doing something that that's just like bashing your head against the wall. A lot of interesting things to unpack there. I think it's kind of like, I, I heard about a company that are, they are making self-driving electric trucks and it's not like they're doing one thing new with, which is electric trucks, but they're also doing them self-driving. I'm thinking of that analogy here because you're not doing just productized service agency, but it's also creator led. So it's kind of like two different layers in this that I think are also interesting to explore. Um, but before that, you mentioned Sahil. So Sahil Bloom, um, a well-known profile for many on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, who has a background in private equity, if I'm not mistaken. Um, That's right. Can you yeah. explain a little bit about your background and relationship together? Yeah. Uh Sahil and I became friends uh, quite a while ago and just became close quite quickly. And I think each of us had this feeling that if we did a business together, it would be really fun. It'd be a good relationship dynamic. Um, our skill sets are very complementary, right? Um, and during the years of me running Everest, we kind of kick ideas around and talk about maybe building something. Um, and when I began to uh, go through the process of like, okay, do I want to sell this company? Do I want to, uh, like, I, I know that I don't want to run it, but do I want to sell it or do I end up needing to, to kind of pivot or wind it down? Um, he really worked with me through that whole process of possibly kind of selling the business, um, which I ultimately decided not to do, uh, because it would have required, you know, like a three-year earn out. And I just looked at it. I was like, you know, given the offer. I feel that if I make a bet on myself to just go do something new, that I'll be able to earn more and less time or equal time, um, but have more fun. And so he was really kind of um, trying to get me to explore that concept of like, let's build something together. Um, I think this was at the time to where Sahil was beginning to explore the idea of, of you know, how does he use his audience to build businesses? Um, and I was just coming down from Everest. And I was like, man, I'm going to take six months off. I'm not going to work for six months and then let's talk. Um, and so we just kind of text and keep in touch. And then at the end of that period, um, I think he texted me. I was like, dude, I think it's time for us to combine our skill sets. And I was like, yeah, it is. Um, and we came to each other with the exact same idea, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is like, let's take creators, um, especially, you know, creators that have like really interesting niche audiences and let's build businesses around that audience. Um, and that's where I kind of came in with the spin of like, yes, absolutely. That's what we need to do. Um, but let's start by productizing it. Let's start from scratch, um, and use that as kind of the launch pad to everything else that we do. Um, so Sahil and I co-founded assembly, um, back in, in April, I think is really when we began tossing the idea around and then launched our first company in May. So everything that we've so done, that's, that's April this year, right? That's April of 2023. Yeah. yeah. So everything that we've done really starts in May. So, so basically from May to today, to, you know, it's, it's the end of August. Um, so it's been a really hectic uh, four wow. months. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay. I didn't even realize it was that quick. <laughs> I know exactly. it's happening. Yeah. Been happening a lot in a short time, but yeah, okay. So you months. haven't had a, you haven't had a relaxing summer then, I guess. No, no. Uh, uh, it took us, it took us three and a half months to crack a $3 million run rate um, across basically four companies because all of our, all of our businesses are subscriptions. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, and they're all kind of geared towards like low churn. Um, mm. So yeah, we do look at things and stack up that run rate. Um, so it's been, it's been moving really, really quickly. So I think a lot of people know about, you know, brands created about what well, by creators or with creator creators in different combinations, probably most notably Kyla Cosmetics, but all the way to The Rock and so on. Um, but people probably very rarely think about this when it comes to a B2B perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but even before that, I think a lot of people, myself included, at least a year ago, had not heard about how you productize an agency. Can you describe a little bit about how that works? Because as far as I know, it's like 
very few meetings, a lot of async comms and so on. Can you describe how that works compared to like a traditional one where you pitch and have all these SLWs and so on? Basically, if you look at a traditional agency and you say, okay, how could I do this the exact opposite way? That's productizing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the typical playbook that we've deployed across our businesses, um, is that the sales cycle is really short. Um, so for most cases, you know, you kind of come in through like a, a form and, and join a wait list or, you know, we'll score that form. And if we think that you're a really good fit, we we'll might push you to book a call. Uh, but typically our sales process is going to be somewhere around a few hours to like a couple of days. Um, hmm. you know, we don't do any outbound sales. We don't do any kind of, um, you know, outbound marketing for our brands outside of the creator partner. Um, and even our creator partners, um, in each company, you know, it's just like, Hey, you know, here's a tweet or here's like a, a mention on, you know, my podcast or newsletter. Um, and that's where most of our acquisition comes from. And then outside of that, the service itself, um, starts typically with just an intro call. Um, there's an easy onboarding process. Um, I'd say, you know, off menu and Hey friends are probably the most high touch to where we'll spend a lot of time with a customer up front to understand, you know, if it's, if it's off menu and they're coming to us to do like brand strategy or product design or whatever it is, we need to really understand what they're doing. Um, but from there, everything kind of goes into a queue system, um, to where it's really driven by a request. Um, so off menu might be like a request to design a brand. Hey friends might be a request to kind of launch this YouTube video. Um, viral cuts is very simple to where it's kind of just, you know, Hey, can you do this quick edit for me? Uh, and then there's an entire team in the background that's kind of going through the actual creative, uh, servicing part of these businesses. Um, and most of the interaction happens in kind of like Asana to manage our tasks and, uh, Slack. Um, and we're just now beginning to build out our own platform, um, to manage our entire customer relationship. Um, so we'll have kind of our own project management tool internally, um, to do that, uh, which is going to be really nice for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, productizing it's, it's basically just taking a, a very, uh, defined output to where X dollars gets you Y output, um, and mm -hmm. services, and there's never any deviation or negotiating on that. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty fixed. And for me as a customer, um, where is the bottleneck in terms of the number of requests I make? Is that, um, is there like an unlimited number of requests or how do you make sure you manage that stream of work? You can theoretically make an unlimited number of requests. Um, we don't use that idea unlimited, um, but you know, we, we try and be a little bit more upfront in our communication, right? So. If you're going to pay us, we try and say, here's the output that you can expect, right? Um, so, you know, for Hey Friends, for example, um, our YouTube agency with Ali Abdal, um, with Hey Friends, we have what's called the creator package and you pay $10,000 a month and that gets you up to six YouTube videos and everything required to make them all the way from, you know, competitor channel research to idea generation, to scripting, to helping you set up your studio actually film to editing the a roll animating publishing the video doing the title the thumbnail everything right um and you know for that ten thousand dollars a month you get six videos just like that um which is incredible value and so our goal really is to make sure that our customers know exactly what they're getting for money what's the main difference for somebody who doesn't know uh, sahil um who is, is big on on twitter and linkedin i guess mainly uh also spreading out to other channels such as instagram but what's the, the guy's big everywhere i think he's yeah, got half right a million now. followers on instagram half a million subscribers on his newsletter like if he comes to a channel he just explodes really quickly. yeah he's uh he's incredibly talented um yeah. what do you think are the most important differences when it comes to creators that are starting off with a B2B audience versus the more traditional influencers that start off with a more of a consumer audience when it comes to monetization for them and so on. I think that for B2B, you can go a lot further with a lot less, right? Um, what I mean by that is, you know, um, so I'll use Ali Abdal. Um, so Ali, obviously has a huge audience, right? He's got, you know, four and a half million plus subscribers on uh, YouTube. He's got, um, only a couple hundred thousand 
followers on Twitter, right? Um, so the, you'd think if, if you look at somebody like Ollie, he's really going to need to use YouTube to push uh, products to his audience, right? Yeah. Um, so if Ollie wants to sell his book, which he just announced, um, he's got to push that to every audience uh, to see a really meaningful lift in the sales because the book isn't expensive. It's, you know, let's say 20 bucks. Um, with Hey Friends, Hey Friends starts at $5,000 a month um, and scales, you know, past, you know, our, our top uh, price point starts at 14000 a month and goes up from there. Um, with just one tweet, right, on hmm. Twitter, no, all these never mentioned Hey Friends on his YouTube channel, just one tweet on Twitter, um, we added hundreds of people to the wait list for Hey Friends, right? And so what we're looking at in the B2B space is that somebody with, let's say, 100,000 followers, uh, I'll use Sahil, up to a million, right, um, can drive a tremendous amount of business um, with the right platform and the right audience because they're not known as a personality, they're known as a subject matter expert, right? They're yep. known as somebody who an audience trusts as a figure that is an expert on a topic or on a certain thread of business. Um, and that can drive a ton of awareness and value uh, to a brand and to a business quite quickly. Whereas I think if you, if you took somebody that only has a few hundred thousand followers across different platforms and you try to get them to sell makeup, for example, it's not gonna perform as well. Right. Um, they're not going to be able to drive the massive amounts of volume. Their brand might not necessar necessarily be as strong in that category. Um, so we try and partner with creators that are really new to subject matter experts, build a business around what their audience knows them for, um, and then have like a really high ticket price point that adds a ton of value back into them. So Hey Friends is the most recent one, and that is the YouTube production agency. And you do, I, I've read you do basically everything except the actual filming. And that's uh, right. Yeah. Yep. So, it's a true done for you service. Yeah. Right. I think it's better if you list the other ones that are up and running and uh, together with what creators you're doing. I think I know them, but I'll let you <laughs> do the talking there. Yeah. We have Keyframe, which is our animation agency with Dan Co. Um, that's a business that we're actually, that's our, that's our smallest business. Um, it's also the most niche. Um, so we're going to be pivoting that business here very soon, um, and doing some really, really great stuff, uh, in animation for, uh, startups and, and other kind of small businesses. Um, and then we have viral cuts, which is our short form editing agency with Sam Parr and Cody Sanchez. Um, viral cuts has grown like crazy. Um, you know, I think all these, you see all these shorts that just have the captions and they're really low quality. We wanted to bring something to the market that was the exact opposite, where it was a really high quality offering, really carefully done animated short form videos that um, I think in our first, in the first 30 days of viral cuts going to market, I think we did 300 million views for our customers mm -hmm. across platforms. Um, so it, it's worked really, really well. Um, we have Off Menu, which is our design agency that hasn't actually launched. So people know about it, it exists. You can work with Off Menu. Um, but we've never publicly kind of done a launch for it. Um, so we're going to be doing that in September um, for next month. And then we have Hey Friends, our agency with Ali Abdal, um, which is the kind of done for you YouTube service. And then a handful of other businesses that we're incubating that will be launching publicly soon. And so Off Menu will also be together with a creator that is on that theme? It will, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And to, to give in a an idea of the ticket sizes here. I guess off menu is the highest, highest ticket when it comes to these businesses. Is that right? Yeah. Off menu is $15,000 a month, um, which is an insane value actually. Um, so off menu is a design agency. Uh, it's a design subscription, um, that gets you everything from brand strategy, positioning, identity design, you know, your brand guidelines, uh, website design. Webflow, kind of no-code development, product design, MVP, animation. Um, it, it truly is an offering that a company, whether you're just starting and you have a budget of like, let's say 45 grand to come in for a few months, you can do everything from your brand to your site, to your product. Um, or if you're a startup that's just raised $150 million and you're ready to kind of uh, drastically expand your design team, without having to go and, and spend a lot of time recruiting, you can tap into us and get started instantly um, and see results within days. Uh, so off menus has been definitely one of our strongest businesses. 
Um, I think that as far as like productized design agencies go off menu is the biggest. Um, I think actually I could be putting my foot in my mouth, but I don't think I am. I think each of our businesses is the biggest in that category. So yep. I think, Hey friends, there's not a lot of competition. There's not a lot of YouTube agencies, which is mind blowing seeing mm -hmm. how big of an industry YouTube is. Um, but I think Hey friends is the biggest productized YouTube agency. Viral Cuts is by far the biggest productized um, short form video editing agency. And Off Menu, I think, is, is probably the biggest by revenue uh, productized design agency. Um, and then Off Menu gets so much demand and a lot of people that just don't want to pay that $15,000 a month price point um, that it's, it's about to birth a child called Bite Sized, um, mm -hmm. which will come out in September. Um, that is obviously Bite Sized, play on the, the menu, um, is a, it's going to be roughly a $6,000 a month price point for design subscription. If you're comparing this with the traditional agencies that you've been running, do you see differences here in the ICP and the ideal customer profile? As in, are you now yeah. targeting a different type of customers than before? You know, in the past, we'd target like Nike, right? Yeah. Um, so we'd want to go in or, or, you know, a big Fortune 500 company, and we'd have to have a company of that size to afford our services. You know, um, just to engage us, you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to hire Everest to do, um, kind of brand strategy, it's going to cost you, you know, 75 grand to start, yeah. right? If you want to hire us to do the strategy and the design, you're talking about, you know, north of 150 grand. Um, so what we're doing with off menu, uh, you know, we scratched our head and we said, Hey, we can charge a lot of money for this, but the sales cycle is so long. It's such a headache. Um, you know, could we do 10 of these and make that 150 grand? and spend less time than just doing one. And when we really got into the math, it was like, yeah, we can. If we, if we strip out all the rest, if we shorten the sales cycle, if we get rid of the contracts um, and we get rid of the headaches, we can do the same revenue with more customers and less overall time, right? Um, and so for us, like, it's a great deal. Um, for our design team, it's even better because they don't have any headaches. They literally sit down every morning, put their headphones on, open Figma, and just start designing. Um, it's, it's really a beautiful business. If the customer wants to pause this, they basically push a button and then they wait for whatever months they want to do. Is that how it works? I'm, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then so, I guess what you can do, which is way harder if you're a one person business, which I've seen, I think, some before, um, is that the people can cover up for each other. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how, when people say that, like I'm a one man design agency, it's like, no, you're a freelancer. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> could you take vacation? Right. No, like, exactly. Yeah. You're a freelancer. If you're, um, if you're sick for two weeks, it's like a disaster. It's a disaster. You're letting everybody down. It doesn't, it doesn't scale. I, I think last time I checked part of a business is that it, it's a machine that can scale. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's just freelancing with a fancy name. Uh, but yeah, I mean, off menu is a, it's a, it's a design, uh, agency. Um, it has a, a pretty big design team. Um, you know, we it's a Monday, I've got team members on vacation right now and everything's mm. working just fine. Right. If you're looking at a more traditional consumer business, let's say it's cosmetics, which I think beauty is like 40% of all creator, uh, led brands. It's a lot of apparel. Um, it's a lot of continuous top of mind awareness mm -hmm. for the consumers yeah. and also bringing yeah. in new people. How does that compare with driving business from, let's say Twitter mainly or LinkedIn? Mm -hmm. Um, is this more of a thunderclap situation, bringing in a lot of people because B2B is way more about the customer relationship and recommendations normally. Um, mm -hmm. can you give some differences in the dynamics there for the creator's perspective? Yeah. I mean, for the creator's perspective, I think it's, it's actually a lot easier the B2B. Um, so, you know, when you typically think about creator led brands, uh, they're, they're mainly are celebrity led brands, mm -hmm. right? Um, so Kylie cosmetics, you mentioned, for example, huge business, but she's a celebrity less of, you know, a pure content creator. Um, yeah. same when you look at like, you know, aviation gen or proper 12 or prime, for example. I think Prime's an instance to where they are creators, but they've kind of transcended into a level of like celebrity. Yeah. Um, funny enough, I would say like Mr. Beast is, is obviously like 
maybe the biggest name on the planet right now, um, but is still a true creator, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Feastables is a business that, um, from what I understand, is approaching 180 million in sales this year, um, which is crazy, right? Um, yeah. But they're constantly having to go to market with it. And at the same time, it's a business that's able to scale that fast because it's got really, you know, the biggest thing on the internet behind it, which is, which is Jimmy. Um, not everybody's Mr. Beast, not everybody's Kylie Jenner, right? So when you think about the volume again, that you'd have to sell of, of a cosmetic pro uh, product or an energy drink, um, it's just not something that becomes feasible for somebody that has only, you know, a million or less followers or, you know, kind of people in their audience. Um, so for us, the B2B angle is really interesting because you can build a great business really quickly with less overall audience because of what you just said. There is that aspect of referrals and of uh, kind of customers being like, I love this service. Let me tell more people about it, right? Um, and then the business is recurring, right? So we're not really selling to individuals that are looking to like buy a sports drink from a store or candy bar at Walmart. We're selling to, to businesses primarily. Uh, mm -hmm. that are going to kind of come to us via a creator. Um, so we're building relationships to where, you know, somebody might sell um, mm -hmm. to a business that comes into viral cuts. And then that customer loves the service so much when they need design, they go to off menu. They're thinking now about going from short form to long form. They hire hate friends. Um, so we have several instances where a customer comes in from like Twitter as a channel through one of our creators and then kind of ends up being stuck in the web of services that we have. Um, so I think that what we've found is that acquisition sources like LinkedIn or like Twitter, spending no dollars on customer acquisition um, is an incredible way to acquire customer. Yes, there's that initial thunderclap that sends hundreds, if not thousands of leads to one of our businesses. Um, but from there, you know, we slowly start servicing them with a really uh, maniacal obsession on the quality of their experience, the quality of the service that's delivered. And that turns into referrals and that turns into customer retention. Um, and that's a, a great way for us to, to build revenue quite quickly without ever having to spend a dollar on marketing. And there's a parallel there, I think with a B2C creator led brand where you can get the first customer through the door, but they do actually have to like your product to be a returning yeah. customer, which yep. is the same thing here. So you talked about your um, ecosystem here, and uh, it seems like you're turning like cost centers within the different businesses into your own profit centers. So kind of like the Amazon, Amazon Web Services model. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and what's the thinking behind it? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so I'm glad you asked. We view phase one of assembly um, as this flywheel, right? Um, so when you look at all the distinct services, they all are services that support essentially the go-to-market of a company, right? Um, so everything from, you know, the brand design, getting a website up or e-commerce to how do we market this on social? How do we really build a connection with customers via like YouTube? Um, so what we're focused on right now is obviously, yes, we need to build a bunch of businesses, just build a great holding company that generates a lot of cash. Um, but when we think about using that cash to do more things, we also want to make sure that everything we need to build a company, everything we need to grow the brand and take that company to market is something that we can do in house. Right. Um, further than that, we can work with our creator partners in a deeper way to where they can use our own services internally to grow their brands, which then in turn grows our businesses, right? So it's one big, beautiful flywheel um, that's kind of quickly becoming this machine uh, that works really, really well. And as we kind of get further in our agency build outs, I see us going and doing agency roll ups ourselves. Um, I think one of the things that's top of mind for us is, you know, the advantage that we have. Um, which is quite unfair, is this insane ability to acquire customers for mm. a service business. Um, there's a lot of really interesting agencies out there that are doing, you know, one to five million in revenue a year. And their biggest constraint is how do I acquire more customers? Yeah. Right? 
So one of the things that we're really interested in next is how do we take those agencies, acquire them, uh, productize their service, and then throw our distribution engine at it. Um, it. It becomes very easy that we can take a business doing a million in revenue and within a couple months, get them on a trajectory to hit 5 million within, let's say, a year, right? Um, so those are ways that we want to, to leverage um, kind of what you said, turning those cost centers into profit centers and really um, continuing to stack up the unfair advantages that we get uh, from building this machine. And then in the longer time frame are you also seeing this develop into products b2c yep. creators what's the vision there i think if you if you play it out eventually yes um some kind of like d2c makes sense uh, but for now i think that there's so much room for growth in b2b um it really feels like there's not a lot of there's not a lot of people building creator-led b2b businesses right um like I guess my question is like, can you name one, right? It becomes difficult. And yeah. if I say, can you name, can you name a creator led brand? It's easy. Prime, yeah. feasible, like like you can do it. That yeah, sounds. you can do it all day. Um, so I think for us, we just really want to exploit uh, that gap. We got to exploit the unfair advantages that we have um, and just really try and really try and build as big of a presence in that space as we can before we kind of shift our focus elsewhere. What other opportunities do you see there outside of where you're at right now? Like you're doing design, you're doing uh, these videos, which is also for people who are interested in creating contents or creators. But do you see other areas that you're not in for B2B creators that you could go into as well, but maybe you won't? We see other areas and we're beginning to explore. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can look at there. Um, digital goods courses, training, uh, SaaS products. Um, there's, there's a whole world of interesting things for us to tackle there that aren't driven by services. How niche do you think the creator needs to be? Let's say you start a design service, which you will do now and, and you haven't, <laughs> you haven't officially done it, but does that specifically need to be a creator that is zo zoomed in on the topic of design? Or could it be somebody more like Sahil, who is in my view, more of a generalist on a number of topics. Mm -hmm. I actually think that, you know, in the regard of a design agency, um, having a design creator as the partner would actually be horrible, right? Um, who's going to follow a designer? Other designers. Yeah. They're not, you know, you're, right. they're not the target. Um, where if you take someone like Sahil, um, you know, his audience across platforms is probably two and a half million, three million people. Um, there are going to be way more businesses within that audience, uh, business owners, startup founders, um, or other creators that need kind of a brand, um, than there would be if it was a designer audience, right? Um, so yeah, when, when we look at stuff like that, I think that, you know, there is what we call product audience fit, um, to where we want to make sure that that creator's audience fits the business really well. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that niche. Right. We can kind of take some liberty there um, as long as we think that there's enough business kind of owners or founders um, or, you know, heads of brand or marketing, whatever it is within that audience uh, to support the service. Um, so, I mean, I think that this is not going to release for a while. So I'll say it now. So we actually have yet to use Sawhill's audience for any of our businesses. Um, so we are going to be doing that with off menu and bite sized. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess the, the other thing that's interesting there is like what, what agency, especially what like subscription agency has a creator with 3 million people on this platform pushing that audience to the design agency? None, right? Um, so when you think about the growth that we're able to, you know, kind of uh, benefit from, from day one, it's, it's pretty incredible. How, how do you fit a creator with an operator? Um, like you and Sahil have done, you guys have known each other for a long time, I guess, but that's a very important part of this. I think I'm not really seeing a creator doing this all by her or himself. It probably mm -hmm. needs this complementary skill set that you guys have. Um, yeah. what's your take on that and, and how, how hard do you think it is to, to make that match? I think it's really difficult. Um, I think there's a few instances to where it's been done to mixed success. Um, 
I, I think one of the biggest things, and I'm going to give Sahil immense credit for this. Um, one of the biggest things is that a creator can overestimate their own value, right? Um, and I think that's really, really important here is that um, obviously a creator with a huge audience, that audience is immensely powerful. Um, and having that audience to serve for distribution is huge. Um, but the question is, how involved is that creator going to be in the operating of that business? And I think what we're seeing right now is that there are some creators that have said, okay, I want to incubate this business and point my audience at it. So let me just go hire an operator and I'll give them 10 or 20% of this business. And the question becomes, well, A, how great of a CEO can you actually get for that kind of ownership structure? Mm. Um, and how big can that business actually get if the CEO's really not that incentivized long-term, right? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the, one of the main things that, um, Sahil and I focus on is that, you know, his audience, his, his network, his relationships are really vital to the success of assembly. Um, and it's been one of our biggest unfair advantages, but you can't eat leads, right? You actually have to build a company that can service those leads that the distribution can eventually feed into. Um, so in this case, you know, one of the things I think that's special about assembly is that our relationship with our structure, or excuse me, our, our structure and our relationship with our creators really focuses on the operations of the company first and foremost. We want to make sure that we have great companies with great operators that are incentivized to build a great business, right? And one of the ways that we have to do that is being very mindful of like, what's that structure and ownership? What's that structure and revenue share uh, between the company and between the uh, creators? Um, and I think we found a really beautiful way to manage that. Um, so that's one of my biggest pieces of advice right there is just make sure that you find a structure that incentivizes the operator and the creator meaningfully, right? Um, you can't do it to where it's, you know, I've got an audience, so I should own all of this business because you're just going to get really mediocre operators that are going to build really mediocre businesses. Mm. Um, and we're seeing that happen a lot right now in this space. Um, whereas there's very few creators that have taken a different route and said, let me get the best operator I absolutely can, um, and incentivize them. And then you're seeing those businesses really blossom. Um, great example there is like Shepard, um, granted like Marshall had already built Shepard. It was already a business before he started working with like Nick Huber and Sean Puri. Um, but you know, Marshall owns the majority of that business and he's a phenomenal operator. That business is growing like crazy. I think they just cracked a million a month. Um, and that's one of the outliers in the space, um, in this kind of creator led B2B space along with assembly. Um, and I think, you know, not to give myself too much credit, but it all comes down to an operator that's just obsessed with the long-term success of the business and has the proper incentive to make that happen. How, how is that deal structured? Usually is that a, like a minority equity on the creator side, revenue sharing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's going to be a minority. Yeah. So there are a lot of, you know, when you usually ask successful people, um, what they've done, it's usually coming down to one thing right now, you're running five different brands and you're going to do it until 12. <laughs> do you see it as a brand? Do you see it as a product? What, what is this really? Like, how is the front of this comparing to the back end, um, of how you're managing it? Can you give me some insight into that? What do you mean in terms of the front and the back? Like, how do you, how do you see that? So viral cuts, for instance, short form mm -hmm. vertical video, it's got its own brand, its own, um, you know, colors, all of that. And then you have, um, off menu, which is a total different offering website and so on. And the same thing with, uh, Hey friends, I guess. And the other ones, um, on the back end of this, do you have, do you centralize this when it comes to the actual operations? Um, or is this total different businesses? Great question. I view it as I'm just building one business, which is assembly, right? Um, so we set out to build a really great holding company of creator led businesses. Um, and it just so happens to be that our strategy was that we're going to incubate a lot of them first. Um, we're very ambitious. We have really big goals. So we wanted to make sure that we moved really quickly, which required building a lot of businesses, right? Um, you know, our, our goal, and I'm pretty transparent about this now. Like our goal that we set out with was to hit $25 million in revenue within 18 months, right? So to do that, we've got to move really, really fast. Um, so is that I'm happy to say ARR that, on a month basis? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, 25 million annual recurring within 18 months. Um, and I'm happy to say that we're on a trajectory that fingers crossed is going to get us there. Um, and the way that we wanted to do that was by building a lot of really great businesses and essentially saying like, okay, if we sit down and we say, this is where we want to be a year from now, how do we just fast track all of that? Right. I'm constantly asking ourselves, you know, if we're saying that, okay, in six months, maybe we'll build this thing. How do we just start building it today? Right. Um, one of the ways that we are able to do that is that we do build each company to be its, ind its own independent company. Um, so Hey Friends is a distinct company with its own team, say with Viral Cuts, Self Menu, et cetera. Um, we're just now beginning to build out like leadership. Um, so I don't know if it's gonna be like a brand lead or a general manager or a CEO. We're not quite sure what we're gonna call it yet, but somebody that's responsible for running the day-to-day -day of that business, the P&L, the growth, all those things. Um, assembly is kind of the mothership that, uh, really sets them up with the initial, uh, distribution, we have the creator, the brand, and really understanding, like, how do we build a recruiting engine, uh, that kind of feeds into each of these companies. Um, so that's where I focus. Um, but each of these businesses, its own business, the one benefit that we have right now is that because they're all productized services, they all have the same playbook, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so underneath the hood, they all kind of have the same engine. So if something breaks in one place, we know how to fix it across all the others. Um, if we need to tune the engine, we know exactly how to do that in one place and it benefit everybody else. Um, so that's one of the advantages that we have is just kind of that common operating structure. Um, but yeah, I mean, the way that we look at it is that our goal is to build assembly, um, and that each thing that we do is essentially its own skew. Right. It's its own product in our lineup um, that we're focused on. So on this trajectory towards 25 million ARR in 18 months, is this following like a, you know, typical agency margin? Well, agencies, a typical agency margin would be like 20 percent. Right. So so agencies typically don't have great margins. Right. Uh, there are a few standouts that do. Um, but for the most part, you know, um, if you look at the big agency holding companies like the IPGs, Publicis, things like that, um, their CEOs are essentially told like 20% is a good year, hmm. right? Um, for us, I would, 20 I would, net? that's 20% net. That's 20% net. Yeah. 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 Um, I would cry if our margin was 20%. <laughs> so for us, um, we're much closer to 60%. Um, so our goal is to build a business that essentially runs at about 60% EBITDA. Um, right now we're pretty much there. Um, you know, the thing is we're constantly investing in growing the team. Um, so, you know, today, uh, we're at 49%, but I have probably 15% margin to play with to where I've spent money staffing up a team that's getting ready to launch. And then, you know, we'll see that grow really quickly. Um, so we're really careful about those margins. Um, and frankly, being productized is one of the greatest ways for us to, to hit those numbers. Right. Because there's less negotiations. There's one price. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, it's a, it's very fixed. So when we build an offering, we're building the margin from day one. Yeah. I guess you've managed to build a, a, a team pretty quickly here. You're fully remote. Is that how it works? We're fully remote. Mm -hmm. Full remote. Yeah. Hiring yeah. Uh, all over the world or? Hiring all over the world. Um, out of necessity, um, you know, our team has grown from three people when we started to a little over 50 people now um, in four months. Um, so it's been it's been intense. Um, there's a lot of cultural stuff that we're figuring out. Um, we have team members all over the globe now and figuring out how to connect them and get them together has um, been a struggle, um, but it's something that we're really focused on. And honestly, you know, if I could hire 100 people tomorrow, I would do it. Um, you know, that is one of the, one of the constraints and, and you might call it a downside of starting with productized services is that, you know, revenue is tied to headcount. So to grow revenue, I got to grow headcount. Um, so our goal is to kind of end the year somewhere around 150 to 200 people, um, mm -hmm. to really kind of be on the trajectory that we need. Um, so we've invested heavily into building our own recruiting team. Um, so, you know, the more that we're kind of maturing. Which honestly, it's just, I, it's, it's fucking hysterical to say, cause it's like, oh, we're four months old, but we're maturing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're starting to build like the shared services team of, you know, accounting and recruiting and HR. 
um, that kind of sits at the assembly level and benefits all the businesses. Um, so recruiting is just a, a major focus for us right now. Will that also become a profit center? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've got plans. Yeah. yeah. So what's the, what's the biggest uh, surprise when it comes to building out assembly, the, the umbrella um, together with your co-founder since uh, you kicked it off in May? The biggest surprise um, is that it works. I, yeah. I think honestly, you know, we, we initially did the math and we looked at the spreadsheet and I made this assumption and I said, okay, what if we could convert 0.001% of a creator's audience? What's the revenue that that drives look like, right? Um, and we really quickly did the math on that. We were like, holy shit, these numbers get big fast. And what's funny is that that math is held pretty true. Um, so everybody looks at it and they say, oh, well, you know, if you're going to try and build a big business for, you know, a YouTube agency, you need so many customers. And I'm like, I need less than 0.001% mm. of Ollie's entire audience to build a massive business, right? Um, so when you think about that, you, you really begin to, to wrap your head around just the scale um, of, of these businesses and, and what creators can drive. Um, so, you know, to be honest, like we are intentionally limiting the scale of each of our businesses right now. Um, you know, viral cuts alone probably has, even if I assume that we converted 30% of the wait list right now, viral cuts is a $8 million a year business today. Um, if I had the capacity for it, um, Hey friends is, is in the eight figures off menu is in the eight figures. Um, it's just a matter of how do we grow the capacity of our businesses, um, as quickly as possible while maintaining the quality. Um, so we're, we're constantly in a game of limiting the scale, um, to make sure that we keep the quality really, really high. Um, so yeah, man, um, the thing that surprised me most is just how well it works. Um, and it's just the whole business is just an execution risk. The opportunity's there. Mm. It's just a matter of how do we execute? How do we build the right team and make sure that we take great care of our customers? What audiences on the different platforms that creators are on from TikTok to Instagram, to YouTube, to Twitter and so on, new platforms coming and going. What are the main ones driving the B2B business here? Yeah, uh, it's crazy actually. I, I'm curious, would you guess which one drives the most conversion? I would assume, well, I would assume Twitter just because of my like limited knowledge there, but it just seems that people are just more into learning and making money and doing business there. That's well, that would be my assumption. Yep. Your, your assumption is correct. Okay. Um, I guess it might, would it surprise you to learn that in some cases, not all, in some cases, Twitter is driving eight times more conversion than like a LinkedIn, for example. Right. Um, oh. Instagram is a joke for our, for us. Um, Instagram drives hardly any conversion because I just, it's just the audience on Instagram that you build is, is going to be more for like what we talked about earlier, like a Kylie cosmetics versus yeah. like an agency. Right. Um, but Twitter is, uh, a fantastic lead gen engine for us. Um, uh, you know, I don't think it's too far fetched to say that we've built multiple multi-million dollar businesses in four months off of Twitter. It's That's crazy. insane. And how it's also you... terrifying. Like I'm yeah. bullish on what Elon Musk is doing with it. Um, yeah. But also at the same time, I'm like, dude, don't fuck it up. <laughs> don't, don't mess this up for me. How, uh, how have you handled Twitter slash X slash threads these last six months? And what's your, what's your take on the future of it? Are you going all in on Twitter? We are helping our creators diversify, right? Um, so we're helping our creators use our, our agencies to diversify their platforms. Um, YouTube, I can tell you, we haven't, we haven't pushed anything there yet, um, but I know that YouTube is a fantastic acquisition source, um, but it does skew a little younger, right? Mm. Um, but for some of the creators that we work with and the channels that they're building, uh, YouTube is going to be a really strong acquisition source for customers. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, you know, even with my own content, which I just started, um, I'm going all in on, on Twitter, uh, you know, LinkedIn, I think you can get some pretty explosive growth there, but I don't know how meaningful the conversation is. 
Whereas on Twitter, people feel much more engaged. It feels like there's a much more stronger and insightful conversation happening. Um, threads, we don't use at all. Um, Instagram, I could care less about um, right now. Uh, I think Instagram will only make sense if we're ever doing like a D2C thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Twitter's huge, but more than anything, it's, it's a newsletter, right? Being able yeah. to drive business from a newsletter is huge. That's still the number one source um, that we can tap into. Um, especially when we get to the higher price point of our businesses. Um, but generally getting awareness and, and getting some of that initial thunderclap comes from Twitter. So Twitter and newsletters are the most valuable there. Absolutely. Yeah. What's your take on, I know you've been pretty public about the numbers and transparent with, you know, how things are going almost from day one. Have you, um, have you evaluated, you know, is that worth it? Cause it attracts competition. What comes out of it? I'm curious to hear that because it's also been a trend, especially in the US, I think, coming to Europe now, where mm -hmm. people are just being very transparent with how their business is going and, and all the numbers, revenue, profits, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have some friends that worry about it from a competition standpoint. Like, hey, like, you know, sharing this data kind of invites competitors. And maybe I'm naive, but my take has been like, you know, good luck. Right. Like if you want to come and compete, like good luck. Um, mm. This is a hard business, right? Like building services is a hard business. Um, if you haven't been doing it for 15 years, like I have in this industry, I think that it's going to be a real uphill battle, right? Like, you know, I've, I've kind of walked the battlefield. I know where the mines are buried. Um, so I have a pretty good understanding of how to build a service business quickly. The other thing is I deeply believe in the unfair advantages that we have stacked up. Right. Um, I think we're, we're playing a real game where one plus one equals a hundred and most people, you know, don't have the ability to do that. Um, and I think most of the other players in the space are already in that B2C world, um, to where it doesn't make sense to come to B2B. Like, you know, the guys over at night ventures, it doesn't make sense for them to come build a B2B business versus mm -hmm. like launch the next feastables. Yeah. Right. Same thing with like Congo brands. It doesn't make sense for them to come and try and build an agency versus launch another energy drink. Um, so I think when you look at the, the B2B space, I feel pretty confident that we have a moat there. Um, but the other piece of it outside of the kind of whole business side um, on a personal level is that when I was an entrepreneur a long time ago getting started, there were people like Joel from Buffer who were open and transparent about what they're doing. And I learned so much from it. It inspired the shit up. Mm. Um, and today, it's really difficult because I think that the people that started the build and public movement, um, they have reached a point of success to where it's not that relatable to everybody. Right. Um, so I try to do my best to just share what we're doing openly in hope that, you know, somebody starting an agency or, you know, somebody that looks at like design joy, for example, and says, I'm, I'm a designer, I'm going to copy this. Um, somebody that looks at that has a better kind of wealth of knowledge to like learn from about the realities of busy, building a business, build it for scale. Don't build it to trap yourself in, in this like endless grind. Um, that's been really special for me, uh, to try and try and do that. Um, and I also love being able to kind of invite people along on the journey, um, versus kind of just building privately. And then one day saying, Hey, like we're doing $25 million in revenue. Well, it's not relatable for anybody. Mm. Right. Um, so I've had a ton of joy in that. And then for us, um, one of the coolest things that I, I don't necessarily think I expected is that it's built incredible relationships, right? Um, just from sharing what we're doing openly, I've made some really, really great friends. Um, it's been a huge asset for us in recruiting. Um, and it also just blows my mind, the amount of business that I drive from my tiny, like, I think I have like 12,000 followers on Twitter. Um, I drive a ton of business to our companies from my yeah. Twitter account, which is so bizarre. Yeah, how do you I mean, make think, the attribution for that? Is that like a question on the questionnaire when people come or how, yeah, or what platform? Is. Yeah, it is. So we always ask people like, how did they hear about us? And we give them mm -hmm. a few options. Um, and then if they trickle into a sales call, um, my team hears all the time that, you know, somebody reached out, um, cause they saw me on Twitter or they read my content or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's been a net positive for sure. Um, and it's something I'm going to continue to do, um, and just try and give, try and give that knowledge away for free. Um, and I, I'm really confident that it's going to help more people, um, than it's going to hurt me. So.
where is this going? If you're at 25 ARR in 18 months, you don't need to no mention a, a number, but what's the greater vision of this? And that's the one question I, I don't know how to answer. Um, I, I think for us, like, put it this way, is this something you you've found to be like what you're going to do for a very, very long time? Are yeah. you looking to make this into a sellable asset? When we first started, I thought this is a good way for us to create a lot of enterprise value quickly and then have a huge exit. I'm not saying that's not a route that we'll end up going, but right now my mindset is that the way we're moving, the cash flow that we're able to generate. Um, and honestly, man, I feel like I'm, you know, a kid in a candy store. Right. Like I, I constantly am sitting at my desk, starting my work day and it feels like play. Like I, I sit here, I talk to creators, you know, um, riff on like what businesses we could build together, pick a business, come up with a name, come up with a brand, write the story, create the model, build the team and then do it again. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly in this mode of just like building businesses from zero to one. And that's been a ton of fun. Um, so my goal is to do this for a while and to, to grow it, to be a really, really big business. Um, super inspired by the guys over at night, um, really inspired by everything that Andrew and Chris have done with tiny. Um, so I think that our goal from a monetary standpoint, um, I'd love to say, how do we build this to a hundred million dollar business a year? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the opportunity is there. It's just a matter of how do we execute? And so I think having a huge chip on my, sh my shoulder. Um, that's kind of the route that we want to go, um, to prove something, I guess, to myself and just everybody else too, that we can do it. Right. Um, and at the same time, like the joy that I've gotten from building this global team so quickly and giving opportunity to people that normally don't have access to the kind of opportunities that we're coming in and providing. Like, we have a lot of team members in the Philippines. Um, and I'm so proud to say that because, you know, they're in situations where you know, they're not getting paid great. And we come in, we say, Hey, we're going to pay you double or even triple, mm. um, what you're making today. Um, and we have team members that are like buying new cars and, you know, buying houses for their family. And that's just like, it's phenomenal. Um, and so if this is a way that we can do more of that, um, I'm all for it. That's awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Of course.